Rembrandt One Rain, or simply as you know it, Rembrandt was maybe the biggest painter in Dutch Golden Age, or maybe even one of the best in history of art. His work included a wide range of styles and subject matter, from portraits, self-portraits to landscapes, genre scenes, mythological and historical and biblical figures and such. At the end of 1631, when he was 25 years old, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam, a city back then rapidly expanding as the business and trade capital. And in 1639, he moved to this house that I'm taking you today. Now it's a museum and you can see where Rembrandt lived, where he ate, where he slept. And also you can see many of his beautiful art pieces. While I am taking you around this house, I want to give you some information, some background information about Rembrandt. He was born on 15th of July, 1606 in Leiden in Netherlands. He was the youngest of nine children in the family. As a boy, he attended a Latin school. At the age of 13, he was enrolled at the University of Leiden, although, according to a contemporary, he had a greater inclination towards painting, and soon he was apprenticed to Jacob van Zwanenberg. And after spending three years with him, he did another short apprenticeship with history painter Peter Lustman, and this was his first time in Amsterdam. In 1624 or 1625, Rembrandt opened a studio in Leiden and he started teaching. In 1629, Rembrandt was discovered by the statesman Constantin Huygens, who procured for Rembrandt important commissions from the court of The Hague. And as a result of this connection, Prince Frederick Hendrik continued to purchase paintings from Rembrandt. As I said before, at the end of 1631, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam, and here he was living with an art dealer, Hendrik van Eulenburg. And in 1634, only three years later, he was going to marry Hendrik's cousin, Saskia van Uylenburg. In 1635, Rembrandt and Saskia rented a fashionable lodging with a view of the River Amstel. And in 1639, they moved to here, this house, an upscale restaurant with artists and art dealers. But the mortgage of this house was going to create a big trouble for this couple soon. The neighborhood had so many Jewish immigrants so that it was called Jewish Quarter. And for his Old Testament scenes in his paintings, Rembrandt was asking his Jewish neighbors to be models for him. Unfortunately, Rembrandt and his wife lost their first three children, only their fourth child, Titus, who was born in 1641, survived into adulthood. Saskia died in 1642, probably from tuberculosis. Rembrandt's drawings of her on her sick and deathbed are among his most moving works. After Saskia's death, the widow Gertisch Dirks was hired as Titus caretaker and nurse. At some time, she also became Rembrandt's lover. In May 1649, she left and charged Rembrandt with breach of promise and be awarded alimony. Rembrandt tried to settle the matter and the court particularly stated that Rembrandt had to pay a yearly maintenance allowance, provided that Titus remained her only heir and she sold none of Rembrandt's possessions. But, well, she broke her promise and she was committed to a woman's house of correction. In early 1649, Rembrandt had already begun a relationship with the 23-year-old Henrike Stoffels, who was his mate initially. And rumor has it, she may have been the cause of Gertrude's leaving and causing all this trouble. Well, although he's artistically very talented, Rembrandt found himself in financial troubles because he was a collector. He was acquiring arts, prints, and rare items and he was paying this alimony, and he has a huge mortgage payment. Well, in July 1656, he declared his insolvency, and he had already transferred this house to his son. But he was lucky because both the authorities and his creditors showed some mercy, granting him enough time to settle his debts. 
So he sold this house in 1658, he sold many of his paintings and some of his collection items, and despite these setbacks, Rembrandt continued to receive significant portrait commissions and completed notable works. This house not only has his masterpieces and also his living quarters, but also his collections, his studio that he used with his students, And upstairs has this area that you can actually draw with other people. You don't have to be an artist to draw here. The stairs are really, really steep. And I think there were at least four floors. So be mindful of that if you are planning to visit. One of the most impressive part of the whole house was this workshop. This lady here was very informative. And she was teaching us how to make oil paint those days. Also in the mosaics, by the way, that are earlier, like in the Ravenna, for instance, you see in Italy, they also brought it already there uh, yeah. to, to, to make pieces of stone. And then, of course, it, it's wonderfully pre preserved because it's, it's the lapis itself. Yeah. It's not a pigment mixed with something. I know. So then you have the... the it's the pure. It's the pure stone. Yeah. Um, but over here, of course, there's pigment made out of it, which also lasts for uh, because Vermeer's paintings are very bright. I don't like it. Um, they, you know, all those colors ask for a different amount of oil. That's why when you make your own paint, you cannot decide to, to mix pigment particles here. First you make the pure colors and then you mix them on your stone or on your palette. That's it. And this is a little like cooking, <laughs> because then when you make your sauce and you see the recipe of bechamel sauce or something for your lasagna, you don't pour in immediately at once uh, one, one liter of milk. You build it up slowly, right? Otherwise you get, uh, how is the word? What's the word? Lumps, lumps, curdling. How? Curdling. Cur oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and so you cannot go back to a solid version. That's the problem, eh? So it's the same here. So you feel what is it doing? Is it getting a little shiny? Um, does it mix? Is it too dry still? So, you know, maybe I need one more drop, but that's hard, the hardest, one more drop. So, it starts to look like paint, isn't paint yet, because it needs another step, and that is pressure. I definitely want more oil, but just a little bit, now I guess maybe I can get this. Just a little. And this is the idea, you're pressing them, and by doing that, you're making sure that it becomes a very strong, inseparable emulsion. Um, in the end, if you follow the right recipe, you feel that it gets strong, but also flexible, and the pressure, uh, it makes it into a very uh, strong oil paint. Somebody wants to feel this, this just make eight, but be careful with your clothes if you want to feel it. You want to feel it? <laughs> yeah. Just, I mean, get this experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to use this directly. Imagine yeah. that you have to do this all day long. Yeah? <laughs> if you are visiting Amsterdam and if you're an art lover, this place is a must see. I had also visited Wright's Museum and Van Gogh Museum, and if you want to check those out as well, I'm putting it right here for you. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.